See if I can get this comment pinned really quick and we will get going. How's everyone doing? What's up, dude? How are you? Pin comment. Perfect. That they don't make that too easy. It's kind of uh kind of awkward. You have to like keep pressing it and hold it and then when people join in you have to keep doing it. So stoked to be back guys. What's up? What's up, Steven? How are you, man? I'm doing good, Robert. Thanks for asking. We got some really cool guests coming on today, so I'm super excited to have you guys. Thanks for joining in. Sunny day in New York. Jealous of that. That's awesome. Yo, what's up, Andrew? How are you? How's it going, guys? Perfect. Thanks for joining in. Guys, today's super exciting. We have two really amazing photographers that are joining us today for Creative Corner. And um, so we have Susan Magnano. She's a photographer, explorer, and educator who loves capturing the beauty of people and places around her. As an award-winning photographer with over 15 years of experience, she leads photo walks for Canon and B&H. That's right, Canon and B&H, the big dogs, which is really, really cool. She's partners with Merrill and Campmore, and she's an ambassador for Lytra and Lytra paint and light painting brushes. So she does a lot of really cool night exposure, uh, long exposure uh, light paintings and those sorts of things. And joining her... Uh, as well as Clifford Pickett. He's a New York City-based professional traveler, humanitarian, and commercial photographer, videographer, and educator. He's an FAA-certified drone pilot. That makes two of us. Nice. Good. You're doing it right. FAA-certified drone pilot. If you're flying for money, go and do the right thing and get certified. That's how we do it. Nice, Cliff. I'm super excited to chat with you. Um, he does a lot of light painting as well, and it's really cool because they live in a, a they travel around in a camper together. And just a lot of really cool insight. They're, they're down in Moab right now, and we'll get into that. So let's join in Susan and Cliff, if we can. Let's see if, uh, let's see if they're ready to roll in yet. If you guys are watching, Cliff or Susan, so let's see if, uh, see if that worked. Let's see if we can pull it. What's up, guys? Hey. hey! How are you? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you great. Let's bring your volume up a little. One sec. Now we can hear you. How's life? Great. Great, great, great. Just trying to get us situated. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like yeah. a little bit tighter when it goes to the dual screen, especially since we're vertical. So unfortunately, yeah. the, uh, Instagram doesn't like to go horizontal like we'd normally like to shoot. So we have to deal with What's up with that? that? I don't know. Unless we're walking around like this all day long, why are we I doing know. this vertically? I don't get it. Our eyes are this way. I know. All I, I want know. to do is instinctively like turn this so we have it side by side. Me too. I had to. Like, have you ever bought something. a laptop vertical? I've never yeah, watched a I vertical did. movie in my life, man. <laughs> I, know, I don't get right? it. I still don't get it. I told don't him. Don't get I, him started, Drew. I know we need to start doing this on YouTube or something else so we can actually get the right 16 by 9 yeah. ratio going, you know? Oh, I want to do something. I want to call, I want to create my own like Instagram that's just the only option is it goes horizontal. <laughs> that's the only feature. Like, that's the only thing I would advertise. And right? I think it'd be a big hit. I'll call it like well, Livegram or something. We could both, technically, we could both turn our phones, but then the comments would be shooting in across our face this way. I know. Yeah. I know. It's, just, it's just a mess. But, uh, I'm super it glad is, you're here. Is. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We're Thanks honored for to be us. here. Thanks so yeah. much. Absolutely. Well, I chatted with you guys yesterday a little bit over the phone, but uh, a lot of the viewers that are watching now probably don't know you now as well as I do. But I'm I'm really excited to talk about specifically kind of because I know you guys are probably in your your traveler right now, your camper, right? Uh, it looks like yeah. In the background. And um, I saw we actually some... have a green screen cardboard uh, cutout. Unfortunately, no, we have cool graphics, but since this is Instagram, we don't have any cool graphics. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I could, uh, we could uh, overlay you with like potatoes or whatever people are doing in their Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> um, we didn't so tell us, that. Yeah, right. Tell us a little bit about yourself just to get started so our viewers can get to know you a little bit. Can you go first? Go for it. Or I'll tell you about Susan. Susan will tell you about me. <laughs> no, you go. You go. That's awesome. He likes to do photography. <laughs> um, so I, I'm a wedding and event portrait photographer. I started out uh, working as a photojournalist and have moved my way into doing it events. But my true love is teaching. So Cliff and I partnered together. We teach uh, landscape and night photography workshops. And 
we were actually out here in Utah teaching when uh, the coronavirus hit. And we kind of got stranded here. You know, everything started closing down. And we live in New York City, so we didn't really want to go back there. It was kind of a really rough scene. So we decided to stay out here and live the dream. It's really beautiful out here in Utah, as you know. And yeah. um, it's a lot safer. And, and we're staying in the friend's RV and just traveling around and uh, creating content every day and instructional videos and just um, living the RV life. That's really cool. I'm, I'm slightly jealous. I'm actually heading down uh, potentially your way uh, this weekend. So uh, maybe Ooh. not to Moab, but to like Goblin, Goblin uh, State Park. Yeah, area. yeah, we were oh, there a couple nice. weeks ago. Yeah, so like Crack Canyon area. So uh, if I do end up going towards you guys, I'll definitely hit you up. But Cliff, let's hear a little okay. bit about what you've been up to down there. Yeah. Oh, man, I don't even know where to get started. Like if you ask me every day, it's going to be a different story. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, so we it started out in Vegas. I was actually probably most of my stories will start. It started out in Vegas. And we, uh, we did a workshop out in Death Valley. And then we did a workshop here. And I was scheduled to fly to Japan about three or four weeks ago now to start like a three month journey around Asia and Europe filming for this organization called the Icon Photography School. And just basically had my phone in my pocket and like a backpack and travel around the world for a bit and just film and create this mastery course. And then I, I guess like, you know, many other photographers in a phone call, everything dries up, right. right? So what do we do? And, you know, after our workshop, we just hit it right with the timing. It was just happening as our workshop ended. So I have a good friend out here that said, you know what, just stay as long as you need. And a lot of my clients, luckily, you know, I've been working with students for years around the world. So I'm, I'm used to working remotely. And I guess in some strange way, uh, you know, I was sort of prepared to be away for a few months. So I had some stuff with me. I had, you know, clothes or whatever. And uh, so it wasn't as much of a, a crazy transition as, you know, for as it is for other people. But right. sure, I mean, you know, I thought I'd be in Japan filming an iPhone photography mastery course. And here I am driving a pickup, living in an RV with Susan <laughs> riding around in the desert by moonlight, <laughs> mountain biking every night. <laughs> and with remotely, it's like, it's a crazy topsy turvy world right now. We're just riding this wave, to be honest with you. Yeah, absolutely. Surf's up, my man. I uh, I just feel like you know, <laughs> there could be, there could be worse things. You could be, you know, you know, not to say that being back in New York City would be worse, but like, it's, you're definitely more safe maybe there, right? So sure, it's nice sure. that you've been able yeah. to make the, the best uh, out of what's going on and you guys are staying safe, but also still staying creative. I think that's really important in times like these. I think mentally, that's a really important thing to be, you know, concentrating on is just staying creative and maybe putting our minds somewhere else, uh, you know, obviously making sure everyone else is safe. So I think that that's really cool. I think it could be worse. So, but uh I, th uh, I think we're actually blessed in a way because we have the safety of being here. Uh, we have the luxury of having time. You know, a lot of our jobs got canceled. We're constantly networking, which is great. But we right. have the time, which, you know, so many times people are just like, I wish I had time to go shoot the stars. I wish I had time to go for that hike. And we're really trying to take advantage of it. Every day we set a goal for ourselves to go um, out and experience sunset, sunrise, or the stars. And we yeah. have kept that goal every night. Um, since no matter what. So this can't months. go late. This can't go late. But really, like I've told my clients, I was doing a live stream yesterday, and I was like, guys, I have to wrap this up because that's, and I think it's going to be important for a lot of photographers. We have to have some sort of schedule or routine, something that grounds us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been the one thing we're lucky enough to be out here to have that as be our routine. But I have to say, if I was in New York City, I would be finding a way to be creative. Yeah. Right? I, I have a lot of friends and family back at home. And we did this thing called projections.live last night. We do this, you know, twice a month now, where we live stream photographers presenting their work and how they're handling us back in New York. And it's, it's eye-opening to see it, but everyone's sort of managing it their own way. And everyone's approaching their own way. And we would be creative, honestly, we'd be finding things to do no matter where we are, even if we were actually stuck in this trailer, which we kind of are between right. 10 a.m. and like 4 p.m. every day with different work going on. We always find creative ways to approach it. We're playing around with lights. We're, we're making smiley faces on our food. We're <laughs> like, we're just throwing things where it, it's always a game. We're learning Tai Chi. Um, I'm meditating. Like now, you know, it's the end of the world. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm med I just meditated this morning again. It's crazy. So like, there's always things to be doing no matter where we are. But at the same time, we are blessed to be stuck where we are here.
Right. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, talking about what's going on now, but let's go, let's go back a little bit into how you guys, you know, each of you got involved in this industry because, you know, you have to start somewhere and clearly you guys are, are making it work now in, in the scenario, but how did this start for you guys? Sure. For me, it's been kind of a, a growing evolution since high school. I took my first darkroom class and I loved it. And I did an internship in high school where I interned for a newspaper and I love the challenge of being able to tell a story with one image and working with all these photographers, it really grew my, my ability to do so. So once I started printing my pictures and I was, I learned that I could really tell a story um, and share through print and media, I was hooked. I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life because I'm able to share my adventures and evoke emotion. And from then I went on to do event photography. I do weddings and portraits still. Um, my favorite thing to do is light painting and incorporating long exposure photography. That's why Elytra is so important to me. I'm able to do a lot of long exposure photography. And then I grew into teaching because my true passion is travel. And everyone would see these beautiful landscapes I would take. And um, people started saying, how do you do those landscapes? And I did my first workshop. And when I did that, I, I learned how much giving knowledge is even better than photographing myself, you know, like telling people how to compose and sharing with them how to look for the right light. And then seeing the joy that they felt was what made me say, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to teach. Yeah, that's really cool. So, just kind of spreading the word around the best you can and, and just trying to help others. I think that's what this whole community is about. That's kind of why we're doing this as well as hopefully, you know, just within this 45 minutes, or however long we talk, you know, people can learn something or maybe be inspired by you guys. Um, so I think that that's really cool. Cliff, what about you? How did this all start for you? Uh, whatever Susan said, it's pretty much the opposite for me. <laughs> okay. uh, I never wanted to be a photographer. I didn't do this growing up. I took one class in high school and I failed it for photography. And then I just hung the camera up and actually I probably threw it out. And I just waited <laughs> until digital photography was a thing because I did not have the patience for the dark room. Really, yeah. they, the only thing I liked about the dark room was Howard Stern in the morning. But it was first period, right. so I was like, no, this isn't going to happen for me. So I literally waited and waited until about four or five megapixels became possible on those point and shoots. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should explore this. And really what happened, to bring a full circle back to Susan, is I traveled. Again, kicking and screaming. I never wanted to travel either. My parents never traveled. My family never traveled. And one of my best friends in, uh, in college, actually it's his birthday today, Tom Metzger. What's up, buddy? Uh, his mom <laughs> met his father in Switzerland when they were working at a hostel. And the rest is history. They had him and all that. And so she insisted that he go back to Switzerland. And so when I was graduating college, he's like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know. He's like, do you want to get a real job? He's like, no. He's like, just come to Switzerland. So his mom bought me my ticket. And she's like, you'll thank me later. And I went to Europe for three months, you know, backpack thrown Europe. And when I got back, it, it changed everything for me, really. Like it was, I, I got back and none of my other friends changed at all. And I had changed so much. I had no way of sharing that with everyone. And so that's really what kickstarted. I was like, what is this medium that I can use to share how I've grown, how I see the world, what I've seen? Otherwise, I felt like, is this even really happening? How do I explain this to people? Like the right. crazy things I've seen and, and shared and experienced. And so that's what started that journey for me. And I was frustrated as all hell. I was pissed off. And I don't understand this. And how come one guy's telling me this? And another guy's telling me that? And mm -hmm. I was like, what is going on? And so to bring up full circle back to what we're doing now is I, I love teaching. It's really three things. It's travel, it's teaching, and it's photography. And above all of that, it's, it, it comes down to just inspiring others and being a part of that community and giving people the solutions and being a resource for people that I wish that I had when I started. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I learned every which way not to do something until I figure out the way to do something. Yeah. And I try and be that resource for others now. No, I think that's great. And, you know, we have to remember as creatives, our creativity and everyone else's as well is, is subjective, right? So um, there's so many different ways to learn. There's, there's people's way that they think is right and some others may think it's wrong. So I think just spreading the word um, as much as you can and letting people implement that into their own creative way is very, right. very, very important, right? So that's yeah. a good segue for this because I kind of want to talk now uh, Susan, you're a Canon educator, and then Cliff, you're like an iPhone educator, I would say. It sounds like you've been doing a lot of iPhone stuff, and I know you have a separate Instagram page for that. 
Um, what's that like being a Canon educator, Susan? And then Cliff, let's get into you with the iPhone stuff as well. Sure. So I've led photo walks for Canon and I've also um, done pop-up events and it's awesome. Like I love my Canon gear. I shoot with the Canon 5D Mark IV. I have all the L glass. Um, it's really inspiring because ultimately as a teacher, you want to get in front of as many people as you can. You want to motivate, you want to inspire. So it's really been a blessing to be a part of their team. And I look forward to like what's going to happen in the future. I know they have some exciting camera gear coming out, like the yeah. 5R coming out. So can't yeah. wait to get my hands on that. And it's just nice to grow with the system. You know, have a, I was a, my first camera was a Canon A1, you know, an old film Canon camera. So it's nice to be part of that and grow up in the Canon family. No, that's great. Are you going to switch to the mirrorless stuff once you get to that point? I think you, so. Like, I've been delaying you... on getting the R, you know, because yes. I feel like the R5 is coming out. It's right. like, you know, the talk about it is incredible. So I feel like, why not? Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, moving it like you were it's saying. It's the kind future. Of moving times. Yeah, it's the future, and, and I'm on mirrorless now as well. And But I still think there's a time and a place to have that, uh, you know, that 5D Mark IV, if, if that's what you're currently using. Sure. So. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. Do you shoot Canon as well? I'm actually a Sony shooter, but I have oh. used a lot of Canon in the past. Like I have a C300 in the house as well, but I, I tend to use mostly my, my Sony gear with the Alpha Series stuff and kind of in that uh, G Master uh, series as well for lenses. I, I, I love that stuff. It's small, it's compact, <laughs> not necessarily the biggest fan of the menu functions, but um, you know, I've, I've trained myself now to get, to get to be used to it, I guess. Cool. Yeah, there's some yeah. guy that just created a mind map of the Sony menu. Did you, have you seen this? You should just Google it. Sony menu mind map, and it was mind boggling, no pun intended, <laughs> to see how this all fit together. Well, I know. Uh, uh, I, I feel your pain because I yeah. shoot Sony as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know Gene on uh, Potato Jet on YouTube did a 45-minute video of going through every single Sony menu function. He posted it a couple weeks ago, and he normally makes roughly you know 10 to 15-minute uh, films for YouTube. This was about 45 minutes long, so it just tells you how drastic and deep this menu can get. But uh, I think that's super helpful for someone who maybe gets frustrated with it and, and maybe wants to throw it to the side. Yeah, but but Cliff, how did you get into the? You're fine. How did you get into the iPhone stuff uh, specifically? Because you're a Sony shooter, but but what got you into teaching more just iPhone centered centered educational content? Well, I, I started with Canon, right? That that S fifty five megapixels. That was my intro to photography, and uh, I sort of just like devolved. I think ever since, just trying to find simpler and simpler solutions. Because yeah. I remember when I got started with that that point and shoot, I call them aim and creates. Um, it, they're so simple that all you have to focus on is the moment of what's going on in front of you. Is the picture actually look good? Is there something interesting going on? What's the lighting? What's the color? What's the composition? You're not worried about, oh my God, do I have the stabilization on? Is that bracketing? Is a self timer and the bracketing on? What menu is that in? Do I go to the aperture? What's my histogram? Do I need to stop this down a third? Where's the exposure bracketing? And then you're just so lost. And so I just, I, I've been always for the last five, six, seven years trying to find my way back to that simple, pure joy of when I first started and I didn't know what was going on and I was just literally pointing. And the iPhone seemed like the most intuitive way to do it because there's there's literally no buttons. The, all right. you're focusing on is, is this a good picture? Is this something right. I'm going to want to look at and someone else is going to look at? And you can't choose. You can't change your aperture. You can't even really change your shutter speed. It won't go past the second anyway if you try and so you're just forced almost. You're forced right. to focus on, is this a good picture? Yeah. What's the light do? What's the gesture? What's, you know, what's the moment? Yeah, you're focused and that's on what I love about the it. composition, you know, you're focused on the lines rather than, you know, the how long the exposure is going off. So you shoot and when you teach this stuff on iPhone, you teach automatic when the shooting automatic, you're not in an app running the camera manually. Is that correct? What's the point? of focusing on all the options with the iPhone if you're shooting the iPhone, right? right. So yeah. I usually, I teach everyone, and I work with Adobe, and you know, and, and the Adobe Lightroom app is amazing because you can shoot raw, HDR raw. So I will use that, but I will always start with that native camera app first for mainly two reasons. One, it's the, it's the simplicity of it, right? If, if I can't force my mind to focus on all these other things that the technical side of me wants to do, I am required almost by looking at what's going on 
is this a, a cool scene? Is this perspective the right perspective? Is this the right time of day? Is this the right gesture? Am I, you know, am I eliciting this, this response from my subject or, or am I standing in front of this, the right foreground? That's all I'm focused on because I can't focus on anything else. So that's what I love about it. But the other thing is using that native camera app, you have the best engineers in the world, literally at Apple, because I'm using an iPhone, yeah. um, have no other job other than to make sure that your pictures look good, right? It does a trillion operations a second, smart HDR, deep fusion, all of that, just to make sure that your picture looks amazing right off the bat. So you don't have to worry about that. Again, you're just worried about all of those things that really do go into making a good image, which is yeah. what it's been for the history of photography and what it will be no matter when this R5 comes out and then the R6 and then the R7 and then the Alpha 10, it's always going to be, it's going to come back to the same factors, right? The gesture, the light composition, the decisive moment, all of that. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're exactly right. And my, some of my favorite stuff with uh, iPhone since we're, ch we're chatting about this briefly is I love when you go to like a major city like New York or Chicago, or they have them in LA too, but they're just, iphone photos on a billboard have you seen these where they just it's and it's, mm -hmm. it's it, all it says it says shot with iphone, shot with iPhone. image image tells a story but it says shot with iphone and now we're finally at that point where a cell phone image is on a billboard and yeah. i think I that speaks for itself all you have to say is shot with iphone the image is what it is and i just i love that i think that that's really cool so i think that builds off your point there of of why you use anything manual and it comes down to like the core, you know, aspect of why we do this and photography. It's it's right there. What you see is what you get. And we're finally at that point. So no, I think that's really cool. I was just curious why uh, or maybe how you got into that field. And, and I think you supported that really well as far as you're right. It doesn't matter if the R5 comes out or what Alpha Line comes out next. And they're working on who knows when that Sony S, A7S S Mark III is going to come out. It might be in 2025 mm -hmm. now. But. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I'm waiting for that. We're, we're doing these moonlight bike rides. It's a full moon uh, tonight, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. And so yeah. it's uh, we're doing these moonlight bike rides, and th the phone isn't. It, it's it's for video and stuff to shoot at night. So I'm, you know, I still like to play with technology too, and I still shoot Sony. But the, I actually just got into it because Apple sort of challenged me. They said give a presentation and just inspire people to go out and shoot. And I had my brand new Sony at the time, A7R2 that came out. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I'll take a trip and I'll try both. And I fell back into love with photography and all the joy it brings me when I was able to simplify. And yeah. So that's why and, I do that. Yeah, that's cool. And it's a little bit easier to teach because most people already have that equipment, right? A lot of times people will come to seminars and they want to learn to shoot photography, but maybe they don't have, you know, a 5D Mark IV with them or, or something because they haven't invested <laughs> in that, right? Uh, maybe they have a smaller camera like a Rebel, but more than likely they have an iPhone or a Galaxy or something along those lines, right? If, if on our workshops, it's, it's, it's just like, it's becoming a thing on our workshops. But yeah. half the people, actually we, at one point we had everyone using their phones. <laughs> and we, at Hasawad, we had a couple of people that are using these really expensive cameras. And then we find them just like getting their feet wet, getting into the river, finding reflections with their phones and playing. Yeah, because it's all you're thinking about is composing. You know what I mean? Right. You just if, if the camera composes, uh, the camera light uh, exposes for itself. It's either going to expose properly or it's not. And you put it in the right place, and you're just looking for the image. And that's like the fun part of photography. And then you can go back and get your other camera if you want to. But I always start. I always start there because if you set a tripod up, that's the first thing I tell our students. Don't do that. You get your side pod up. You put it. It's at five feet tall, which is about ninety-five to six percent of pictures that are ever made you know five feet tall and i was like just put it away just put it all away just take the phone out play get the composition and then if you want to you know focus on it and bring your camera out do it but it's 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 let's get back to being creative rather than being technical yeah it allows you to look at those composition lines and i think that's a good uh segue for this this question we had uh someone ask i have problems with composition any tips that's uh from at keen underscore pictures 08 ask that so do you have any tips for composition uh for the viewer good question keen um a couple things we look for is leading lines you know try and find something that leads your eye through the picture um or framing interesting framing try and shoot through something um do you want to add something? yeah the you know the best thing about if, if i bring about the iphone for a second it's the fact that it doesn't go to your eye 
And if you're using a mirrorless camera or even a camera with a live view, hopefully you have a, a camera that has one of those flippy screens or a flip out or flips up or down. Yeah. I argued with Canon for years about this. You know, like we're not putting this on our pro model. So I was like, why? I'm a pro. Why? I would like a flip screen. But if you can get it away from your eye, I almost want to just tape up that eyepiece because that's the quickest way to destroy the creative potential of the scene is to put the camera where your eye is because you're not going to want to lie on the floor and you can't get much above where you're standing. But if you can get used to or get comfortable with or just get a habit of putting that live view on and getting low and getting high and putting it on the other side of the fence or getting below the table or above, that that's going to change just it's going to change how you see the world it's not going to be how you see with your eye it's going to be what the potential of a scene could be if i put the camera here i put the camera there and the best way to do that is to get out of your eye or off of your eye use that live view and start moving around and see what you get yeah i think that's fair for sure i was at the uh, salt flats last night out of bonneville and uh i had my eye down and i was squatting because i wanted to see the texture of the sand and I had like a 70 to 200. I had some friends walking. And actually, it was my wife and my dog. I don't know why I said friends. But uh, so I was, <laughs> I was, uh, they're my friends, I guess. But yeah, um, your friends. Your dog's your best friend. Hopefully, exactly. your wife is too. And happy birthday <laughs> to your wife, right? Wasn't there a birthday? Yeah, it was. Thank you. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah, that, that, thank you so much. Yeah, we had a good time. So we, we went out there. But uh, to your point, I was looking through the eyepiece. And I couldn't. I wanted to get lower. So I got that screen. And I, and I looked down. So... I think just supporting your point there, I, I mean, I had to, you know, kind of tape up the eyepiece and, and just use that screen. And I, especially for Instagram, right, we're looking at our screens and they're this big anyways. And I think that that kind of, I think that kind of benefits us, whether it's being lower or just like you said, kind of seeing the real, the real image through the screen. And I want yeah, to- and if you, just a, one more comment on that. If you don't have one of those flippy screens, right? I don't even know if that's a technical term, articulating screens, right? Yeah. What you could do is turn your phone off and put it like right next to your camera. If this is your camera, put it underneath the screen. And this becomes like a really nice reflective surface like this. Yeah, she's got, right? Oh, nice. So you can put the camera on the ground, shut the screen off, and it becomes a mirror reflection. And oh, it'll nice. help you get that composition without, because you can't get your eye to the ground when you're that far to the ground. So that's what I'll do when I'm shooting with a DSLR mirrorless. Oh, I'll still cool. use my phone as a mirror, yeah. That's a nice uh, photo hack there. I've never thought of that, actually. With uh, mm. I think that that's really good for, for uh, anything that's just flat against there and it doesn't articulate out. Like the Sony, we've gotten lucky, and we can get this way. Maybe the yes. 5D is yeah. still pretty flat. Maybe that R5 is going to swing out. So there's, there's so, so many yeah, different models. Will. Yeah. So I want to get into now, I want to get into Lytra and specifically what you do, because we've kind of started on how you got here and what you guys are doing now. But you know, you guys have a lot of really cool images that I've been looking at and that you guys have been sending me and, and I've been looking at both your Instagram accounts. And how has Lytra made your guys' life easier as far as I know you're traveling and, and, and doing this stuff kind of remote, but how has that helped you kind of get some of the cooler photos that I've seen? And we'll get into this stuff too, but uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of amazing photos here and we'll, we'll get into these individually, but just to show the viewer uh, as you are guys are talking about it. What is, how has this helped you guys sure. out? So number one, the portability of it. Come on, this can fit in my pocket. I actually pulled it out of my pocket. I couldn't find it. It was in my coat pocket. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it just is so portable. Uh, you, I used to bring a lot of lights with me when I traveled, even like speed lights are much bigger, twice as big or four times as big as this. And um, even bringing the whole other systems that you see use, this is just so compact and so easy to bring that's made our traveling so much easier and you could bring a bunch of them so now you have a lot more power um in the in your pockets and look at this come on they're so tiny yeah and um, i think we, we've always had tiny but it's now it's the power that comes yeah. out of how small it is right because now you guys are able to blast this on the sides of of these rock faces and paint sure. lights up on so top explain of a there. little bit about this shot I yes. had this light on a tripod pointing at the mountain, kind of articulated up just so it wouldn't be um, hitting the ground as much and it would, it would hit a little bit of the sky on for three hours at 5%. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, the battery like barely waved. It was like still like mostly full. And I love this light because you can also power it down. Sometimes you have these lights and they're too strong. And if right. you want to do long exposures, like what I was doing here, 
um, you need to be able to power it down. So sometimes having too much power can be detrimental to your long exposure photography. I also was able to create a time lapse of the Milky Way rising across the sky. It was really spectacular. Just using this and stitching together all these films and making a video. It was really incredible. And this, this lasted for three hours. It was amazing. Yeah, so you had it on like maybe 15. 5%. 5%, okay. 5%, 5%, 5%. only. 5%. Yeah. Because yeah, there's that's such long crazy. exposures. Yeah. 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 How long is your, how long are, is that uh, your frame? So open? this was um, a 25 second, 2.8 at probably uh, 4,000. Yeah. See, and that's I just did that for every second for three hours. And then I was able to get the Mukue rise from behind that rock ridge all the way across the sky. And it was also a meteor shower. So I was able to get meteor, meteors like shooting through the scene. And with the, we were just throwing these in the air to create the meteor effects. It's <laughs> yeah. a bunch of these. We were just juggling them. <laughs> they were just falling. Yeah. Another usage of using the lights. Totally. Like just <laughs> buy a bunch of the torches and just start throwing them through a scene. You create your own meteor showers. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful, you, right? You don't have to wait for the certain time of year to get that meteor shower. Litria showers. Thank you, everybody, for the love. It was really spectacular. So let's so talk about this one a little bit. This is another shot. Um, we put the lights in the car, and we actually set off the alarm, so that's why the car lights would go off. <laughs> and we. <laughs> that's why no one else is in the picture. <laughs> yeah, so we, we set the car alarm off, and we just left the lights shining, also at a very low capacity, and then that's what caused the outside lights as well. So. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I love the, uh, it almost looks like you've used like filter sets, like a red uh, filter right. set. It's just the uh, alarm going off. And what's your, <laughs> uh, what's your uh, uh, camera settings on this? Oh, man, I wish I remember. I think it was probably 30 seconds, 2.8. And it was actually a little bit earlier. We still had blue hours, so probably at like um, 800. Yeah. 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 Getting a little yeah, bit of seconds. Like, maybe, like, yeah. maybe not even 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, that's 15, 15, 15, 30. So Cliff, how is, I mean, I know you guys are doing a lot of, of I don't want to say similar stuff because you, you guys' work's very dynamic, um, but how has Lytra helped you guys? Uh, or, or sorry, Cliff, you yeah. specific. First of all, I mean, like to your point before, I started with these little guys here, mm -hmm. right, torches, and I, I still think they're, they're the lightest and brightest, most portable light you can get your hands on anywhere, right? So... And they're basically indestructible, which is really good because I tend to beat up my gear. I'm kind of yes. at the point now where if it doesn't fit in my pocket, I don't want to carry it. <laughs> and so having literally like a light in my pocket, the, the best analogy I've heard, I think it was Scott Kelby that said, if you don't have a light, you're basically, you're at, you know, you're at the whim of nature. You're just a part-time photographer, mm -hmm. right? So when the light goes down or if it goes behind a cloud or you're just, what, what, do you, what can you do? And all of a sudden now you have this, ability to create an image anywhere right yeah. and they're bright enough so these things are great i would use them anywhere because i do a whole variety of things i do interior shots i do 3d imaging i do a lot of uh you know video work we're actually right now i can show you what i'm talking about like yeah, so great. i'll do a lot of skype and zoom calls and and interviews i work with you know students all over the world and you just pop a couple of these on and it's like now it doesn't matter if it's a rainy day, if it's a sunny day. And so that's, that's really made my life easier. And then also from a travel perspective, if I go into a dimly lit room, I don't want you – and a photographer, if you guys get into lighting for more than five seconds, you're going to realize you never want your light like this, you know, right where your lens is. So just the ability to just hold it. That's all you need to do is hold it like this. You can just yep. put the light anywhere. And now – and just like hold it to the side. Well, if I hold it like this, that's, that, that just doesn't – that doesn't show the point. I got to hold it out like this. And now you have off camera lighting in a very intuitive way where you can yeah. see the shadow. So the constant light, I think, has been, especially when you first get into to lighting. And then once you get so seasoned, you, get, you, get, you understand it, you get back to that, that intuitive nature of seeing what the image is going to look like before you take right. the picture. Seeing yeah. where the shadows are going to fall and what that means. If I have front light versus side light versus Rembrandt versus up lighting. And so it's really nice to just have that intuitive nature to it. And then from a from an educational standpoint, um, what's better than having like a bunch of these guys that we can give to our students, we can hold them up, they can see 
where the light's falling, and it's we don't have to worry about triggering. We don't have to worry about batteries and, and remote triggers and different camera models. We can just create the magic of light and see it in real time. And then to take it a step further, when you go to the uh, to the pro, I this I think this is like the sweet spot for you guys yeah. because it's just a little bit heavier. It's a little it's but it's brighter, and it's got bicolor. Right? This yeah. thing keeps on slipping. <laughs> it's crazy. So let me just tighten this up. And so the fact that we have this bicolor and I can change the color temperature to match, because right now we're sitting by a window, which we have actually pretty good light in this RV because it's yeah. we're side lit, right? We have this scrim from above and we have a side lit in the corner here and another one behind us. But if that sun goes behind clouds or it's getting late in the day or early in the morning, I, we can just pop these lights on their daylight balance and in a heartbeat we can change it. If I have to bring in a little fill from the RV and that's tungsten light, about 3,600, we can just like mix that in without gels. Because if you're like me, I, I probably have like 10 sets of gels. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Scott keeps on sending me gels, I keep on losing them. But <laughs> if I have this bicolor, I can just dial it in. Yeah. And it's just really intuitive use. And it's nice to have that extra battery life available yeah. to you, especially when you're out in the desert for three, four, five hours in the, in the dark at night. It's nice to have that extra battery life. Yeah, these things are probably came in pretty handy for you specifically because, you know, again, I think you're talking about, you know, how rugged they are. I mean, you can use it at, for a hike. If you're hiking out to go get photos, you can turn it on and use it for hiking. And then you don't have to worry about it yeah. going out of battery by the time you're using it for your photo. Uh, you can drop Ooh. them on. Yeah, on the red rock and it's not going to do anything. They can get wet, which is amazing. Drop them in yeah, the yeah. river. Yep, drop, drop them in the river. In the sink or it... pier on it, whatever. And then we can put this, yeah. we actually did this uh, a couple nights ago. We put it on the front and back of our bikes. Yeah. Because they're so easy to mount, right? Especially these guys because they're, they're magnetic. And I have these little magnet mounts. Um, I kind of made these myself, but I kind of screwed together a quarter 20 here. And it just like pops on. And now anything with a quarter 20, I can I can just mount this. Yeah. So it becomes really easy. So we can mount them anywhere. And when you have light that you can put anywhere, that, that really changes the game for the creative potential of everything you shoot. Like you just think in terms of, well, no, the light's not good enough. I can't do that. No, you can put a light literally anywhere now and yeah. see the result and, and not, not have a trigger, not have this whole setup. So yeah. it's really nice. It's cool just because from talking to you guys now, I could tell that you guys were using the lights because you've got your main source coming in from the window. And then you've got a nice little kit coming in on the sides where I saw your My hair up there. Yeah, look, your <laughs> hair's lit nicely. And then, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and again, not having big panels in your RV. I'll show people. There you go. Yeah, let's see it. So there's your main. And that's, that's the corner over there. And yep. then here's the light. And then there's your composition kick right there. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. You fill it in a little if the light starts dimming with this guy. Yep. Whatever that is. And then we can also just draw the shape if the light starts getting a little dappled. Yeah, if you want to shape it a little bit, you can yeah. pull that down and, and make it less on your face and then kick that over to that main. I think that that's really cool. And I think just portability for you guys and ruggedness is really key right now because it sounds like maybe back in the day you used to use strobes. Is that true? Did you use a handful of strobes? Yeah, like for weddings and uh, events, I would always use strobes. Pocket wizards. We have yeah. a RF, you know, situation and... Yep. the batteries and it wouldn't trigger all the time and uh the weight the cost and then you wouldn't even know the shot that you got until after you look at it and then it's this is a much easier much more intuitive way of working yeah, yeah. and as yeah, the whole absolutely. world comes into video and virtual yeah these are perfect for yeah, definitely yeah. focusing on the teleconferencing a lot right now, too, with Lytro, you know, having the suction cup mount that they just released to go on the back of your computer, kind of almost in place of where your uh, torch is right there, uh, close to your window, uh, kind of mocking that. So clearly it's helped you guys in many different aspects. Um, what is your guys' favorite accessory that you guys use? I mean, you're doing a lot of light painting. Are you guys using diffusion? Are you Have you done much with color? Yeah, I always here? use this. This is my go-to. Yeah. I rarely yeah. don't use it because I feel like I like the softer light. This is yeah. the silicone top. It's yeah. my favorite tool to use. Yeah. Oh, man. I Actually, my favorite feature, it's not even really an accessory. It's just the fact that I can change the color so I don't need gels because yeah. I'm going to lose them. Yeah. But I have to say that that suction cup is a great idea, especially as so many people are going to Zoom. 
I'm, I'm literally three, four, five, six hours a day on Zoom with students all over and clients. And I can see as a photographer, it drives me crazy because yeah. I'm like, just put a little fill light there. Just put some light in. And if you just have one little cue, especially right. these, you know, the pros, because you can dial in and you can mix it with the ambient as a light goes down. Uh, that's really nice. And um, what I usually do is I just use a little putty if I don't have that suction cup. Yeah, sure. And I'll just, I'll just, I can literally place it. If you can grab that camera, I'll show you what I mean. Like I can like put this on the back. And I can just like stick this on a window or I can stick it anywhere and it just, it just stays. So that's like, perfect. but that suction cup makes life a lot easier. Totally. Yeah. No, I think yeah. that that's really handy though. I've never actually seen anyone do that. I know obviously we've used uh, a lot of, you know, the magnets or you could put it on the framing of the window, but if you need that in a certain spot, then you can, you can tack that up. Now, let me ask you this. Have you used the lights or a pro with the cell phone accessory? Have you, gone and set that light somewhere, maybe to underlight uh, a mountain range and then hooked it into your cell phone and, and changed anything there? I haven't really used a Bluetooth much. I have, I have used it Jackson's events a couple of times. And what I'll do is if we bring the house lights up or down while we're shooting okay. a video, it's a very small little key light that just gives me a little bit of fill for the presenter. And so I don't want to walk back up and forth so I can kind of dial it in that way, which is nice. Um, but usually if I'm yeah. working with the cell phone, I like kind of tweaking a little bit so I can come back and just dial it in a little bit and come back and dial it in. So I'm always kind of moving around anyway. I'm just like kind of fine tuning right. it. So, yeah, but I did see that mount that you can put it right on the cell phone holder itself. But I usually yeah. find that I, I like just kind of holding it to get a little bit more shadow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah more depth. But the magnet feature, especially on the, uh, on the torches, that's so cool. You could just like, pop it anywhere and if it's not magnetic a little gum or that suction cup and the fact that they're so light you can put them anywhere right. that's right. the beauty of it you know you can literally just have this source light anywhere that's yeah. so cool yeah it's it's like again it just comes down to that portability but then again we've always had portability i think but now it's the power behind the portability yeah. that's what's making a, a big difference and just the ruggedness to complement it so we had another question pop in for you guys uh, how do you manage iPhone color and low light correction when using lights? Spec yeah, specifically so for the iPhone. iPhone color becomes a little bit fun because if you're using that native app, especially, you, there's no white balance feature, right? right? So if you're outside, we pretty much know the color of the sun for that point. You know, we, we've got that. Like, we know daylight balance. Like, so if you're shooting outside before you get into, like, the magic hour, even as you get into the magic hour, the, the iPhone's going to balance really well. What you're going to run into problems with if you're going indoors, right? Because every lamp, every lampshade, every surface, even just how old that bulb is in each one of those lamps is going to change the color temperature, and that will throw the light off. So that's where you want to get into, like, a more manual app. Uh, I'll use – typically, there's there's two apps that I'll use, ProCam, which is really nice, and then Lightroom Mobile. And I'll always go to Lightroom Mobile when I need that power and flexibility. So there you can dial in the white balance. And then you can get creative, right? So then you can, can go out and say, I'm going to put it in tungsten, which is going to turn everything blue. And I'm going to put a CTO gel or dial in the, the tungsten down to maybe 3,600 or 3,000 on the uh, on the pro model. And then you can play around by, by popping your subject out. And you can do that with a phone too, as long as you have white balance control, which in most third-party apps you have. And I'd recommend starting with the Lightroom Mobile app first. Cool. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice there for sure. Um, yeah, it's always interesting hearing, you know, when you are using something that's auto and the auto white balance, especially using filters and things, especially like right now, you know, we're, it's basically on auto, right? Cause we're, we're filming through the Instagram app. So it's taking yeah. you know, whatever it can and, and compensating for that. So I don't know. It's, it's, do you find that and this is a question for me now, do you find that you would rather, even though, you know, you have a camera set up that you could use manually, would you just soon still be in auto mode on the iPhone when you're having lighting issues, or would you switch to a manual app in the iPhone? Well, I'm always in auto, uh, even when I'm shooting on the Sony, I'm always in auto, but that's for a different reason. That's because if we're shooting raw, right? Yeah. I mean, it depends if the question is really for stills or video, right? I yeah, was it's assuming true. it's for stills. stills for yeah. stills, I always keep it on auto because I'm shooting raw, and yeah. then you can tweak that in, and you're going to want to tweak that a little bit. Uh, for video, you can tweak a little bit more, but you don't have that flexibility. So you really want to be 
more comfortable dialing in that exact white balance if you're shooting video or if you're shooting uh, stills as JPEG. But I'd uh, say, you know, just to give yourself the maximum flexibility, you switch over to Lightroom Mobile for talking about stills and shoot in the DNG RAW, and then you can dial in that white balance perfectly to get yeah. what you want. Otherwise, you're kind of stuck with the white balance you get. For video, you want to be a little bit more careful. That's where having like something like the, the pros come in because you can really dial it in and you have a nice, big, beautiful screen to, to see the results in real time. Here, yeah. we don't have the flexibility inside of Instagram, but in video mode too. So in the native camera app, you don't have white balance in the video. But if you go switch over to something like Filmic Pro or you go to, uh, we're using the DJI Osmo 3 mobile to get gimbal video while we're out here, everything we're shooting on the phone. Um, that you can lock in the white balance too, and you can tweak it so you can get yeah. the white balance you want. And you can just fill in and just customize a little bit more by choosing the buy color option in the pro model. Yeah, just to kind of match it up. No, that's great. Yeah. I think that that's, that's really cool. It's super interesting take on what you guys are doing out there. Again, you guys are in a really unique setup. So it's really fun to hear you guys with tips and tricks. Um, I like to leave, we have a little bit of time left, but I, I'd like to leave the viewers on, you know, a piece of advice, uh, maybe whether they're trying to get into the industry full time. This is probably something that you could take from the cl your guys' classes, maybe that's less hands on and more just uh, information. But w for someone who's wanting to get into this industry, what is one thing that they should look for or a couple of things they should do to get into this industry full time? Hmm. Whether it's photo or video. So from a professional standpoint, how to get into it full time. Uh, the best advice that I would give is to first get a cell phone holder that's going to squeeze this a little tighter. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the best advice I would give is just to say yes. Um, if someone asks you if you can do something, yeah, I can do that. All right, that's how I started shooting video. Can you shoot video? Yeah. Can you shoot this job? Yeah. Can you do this? Yeah. Can you shoot drone? Absolutely. Can you, yep. whatever it is, yeah. And then figure it out. Like learn by doing. Learn on the yeah. job because the, the traffic lights of life are never going to be green at the same time. So if you wait to take a job until you know how to do something, you're never going to get anywhere. Just it's a little scary, but say yes, tell them you can do it and then figure it out and then test it out and then yeah. do it. I'm going to I'm going to kind of agree and counter agree. I would say do as many internships. Um, study under people who are doing what you want to be doing so you can actually be a little bit more prepared than just jumping in and doing things. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess I'm a little bit more prepared. He's a little bit more wingy. You could tell we're a different dynamic. But I would say I did a lot of internships and studied under a lot of amazing photographers just to feel comfortable and also like gain my vision, gain, um, gain my insight and gain my confidence and then jump into doing it on your own. Or if you're like, Cliff, just try it. Just, yeah. just, if you can uh, if you can operate at at that edge of what you think is possible if you can operate that edge of what makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable and then that will constantly push you and uh, i think that's a as good advice as i can give people is to do yeah. what scares you a little bit put yourself in that situation and you'll find that you'll rise to the challenge but arrive educated do your youtube school <laughs> homework so speak you're to prepared. her about it yeah speak to her about it Jeez. Just, I'm you just gotta, gonna say talk to Susan. Yeah, right. Just, uh, yeah, so if they say no, then talk to Susan. If they say yes, Cliff, they're in your class. That's fine. I guess. Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, yeah. I think it's good to be a yes man. I think both of you have really solid points there. And I think it really depends on your personality. But that's also why, you know, maybe some people are doing this full time and some aren't. So I think that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic industry. And again, everything's subjective, right, that we're creating. So I don't know whether someone's scared or whether someone's just hasn't had the chance to, to finally do it. I think both of those pieces of advice are amazing for individuals out there. Um, I, we have one more question that come in we have to wrap up here shortly, but what, what are your settings out there in the field? I think, uh, I think there's a the lot. Star? Yeah. I think maybe <laughs> specifically for the star photo potentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was about 25 seconds, 4,000 ISO 2.8 to catch that Milky way with the, crystal clear sharp stars keen feel free to message me privately i'm happy to talk you through uh, my setup or anyone else who has questions about astrophotography and using lights or lights to get amazing astrophotography we're happy to help you guys out we do yeah. workshops out here we'll just uh do a little um talk we'll be doing workshops out in moab and we're doing a fall foliage chase hopefully once the quarantine ends by fall, uh, we'll be doing a fall foliage chase from Nova Scotia through Acadia National Park 
down to uh, Vermont and to um, New York City, hopefully ending at B&H uh, Photo for a Fall Foliage Party. But we do workshops out all over the place. So if you guys want to fine tune your photography landscape skills and learn how to light paint, we are happy to help you with that. Yeah, come join us. And if you guys have questions, just reach out to us directly. We're happy, like like you said, bef even before photography, we're here to be a resource for everybody. So we'd love to hear from you guys. Reach out. Yeah, and just so, just in case viewers aren't ready to be a yes man, just ask Cliff and Susan. And, uh... <laughs> I'll, I'll inspire you. I'll make you a yes man. I'll 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 push you just. To the, I'll give you a little kick in the butt you need to push yourself and and kick your game up a little bit for sure. <laughs> and I'll I give you the so. education you need to feel confident in doing that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that that's great. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for being on. You guys are incredible. Um, your work's incredible. Both of you guys are awesome. I enjoyed our conversation today and yesterday. And I hope we get to cross paths here soon. Like I said, if I I'm down so. the way, yeah. I would love to hit you guys up and we could hang out and, and get some really cool long exposure stuff. And We'd love you guys that. Up, really man. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, well, thank for you. tuning in. And thank, thank you, Lytra. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Time, guys. Thank you, guys. Talk soon. Yeah. Right. Take care. Bye. See ya. You too. Yeah. See if I can get you guys kicked off here. There we go. <laughs> Bye. Awesome. Susan and Cliff, they're amazing. They're super, super talented. Like, guys, check out their work. Their handles are down there. It's uh, Susan Magnano and then Cliff. It's not showing. You got to click the more button. And also, my handle is down there as well. If you guys have any questions for them, feel free to reach out to both of them. Like I said, they're amazing. And if you have any questions for me, reach out to me there. You can direct message us and then check out their lighting classes. If you are in a situation to where you really don't feel like you have enough knowledge, they would be a great resource for you, as you can tell. This is your Creative Corner. Thank you guys so much for watching. Next week, we are moving to Thursdays only. So we're going to quit the two a day. So it won't be Tuesday and Thursday anymore. It'll just be on Thursdays. And we will be creating more content for you guys in uh, the actual posting. So hope to hear from you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching. You guys are awesome. Thanks for keeping us company. And we will see you next Thursday. Again, this is Lights of Creative Corner with Drew Williams. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys.